And now with analysis of this explosive 11-page testimony by Archbishop Vigano, the first Vatican official to charge the Pope and others with covering up sex abuse in the church, we are joined by the Papal Posse. Editor-in-Chief of thecatholicthing.org, Robert Royal, is here with me in studio. And from EWTN Studios in Rome, canon lawyer and priest of the Archdiocese of New York, who we pulled from his vacation in Rome, Father Gerald Murray. Gentlemen, thank you both for coming out and being here. So much to talk about. Uh, let's get right to it. How seismic is this, and what do you make of Vigano's credibility, which has been under assault, Father Murray? This is very big. Um, this is something unprecedented in our lifetime, and uh, it is, for me, a crucial moment of truth in the life of the Church, because what the Holy Father, Pope Francis, has been saying throughout his pontificate, and what uh, the American bishops have been trying to implement uh, ever since 2002, all of that now is on the line. Are we going to indeed root out sexual abuse in the life of the church? Will the abuse of authority be exposed and punished? And I have to say, I have high regard for Archbishop Vigano. I admired the work he did when he was nuncio in the United States. And when I read his testimony uh, this past Sunday morning, uh, while it was stunning, I also said, uh, this is a man who lives the gospel because he's speaking the truth. And he says that truth needs to be known because the church is in grave danger. So I commend him for what he did. And now the question is, how can we go ahead and either prove or disprove what he right. says? And then what are the consequences? Now, there's an effort here. Um, and Robert Royal, uh, Archbishop Vigano, was deeply involved in trying to uproot corruption at the Vatican City State. Uh, now he's being dismissed as a partisan. They say he's tr they're reducing this to kind of a grudge match and a power fight for power in the Vatican. Your thoughts on that analysis? Yeah, I think we ought to recognize that that's what we're going to hear largely from the secular media, but also, unfortunately, from voices within the church. Mm -hmm. And I would just say, to begin with, that when we hear things like this, we should not be distracted from the main point. The main point is not why he did this or what context this, this falls in. We know that the church is divided on a variety of things. Francis has been very much loved. He's been very much controversial. But what, is, what we have here is a man who ha had the most information, both because of the job he had before he came to the United States. Running all the embassies right, of the world for the Vatican. And when he was here, where he was very, very good. Mm -hmm. uh, almost everyone agrees upon that. We have a man who has named names. He's talked about where the documents are. He's talked about specific dates when things happened. Mm -hmm. He may be wrong about some of these things. He may be misinformed. He may be misguided. Mm -hmm. But we have a starting point now to deal with what, with what has to be considered the greatest crisis in the church at this moment. Yeah. And I, I want you to stay with us because we are going to get into the marrow of these charges. We're going to put up right now some of what Archbishop Vigano is contending and then we're going to delve into the challenges to his credibility, which are numerous at this point. We're getting into all of that, so stay with us. It's a special edition of the show. As I said to Ed Penton earlier, the heart of Vigano's allegations is the contention that between 2009 and 2011, Benedict XVI imposed sanctions on Cardinal McCarrick. He was to live a life of prayer and penance, forsaking public events and no longer saying Mass. Now, this was all due to his sexual abuse of seminarians. Settlements had been paid out in two dioceses, which the Vatican eventually got wind of. He writes, this is Archbishop Vigano, particularly of sharing this information with Cardinal Archbishop of Washington, Donald Wuerl. We'll put it up on the screen for you. I myself brought up the subject with Cardinal Wuerl on several occasions, and I certainly didn't need to go into detail because it was immediately clear to me that he was fully aware of it. I also remember, in particular, the fact that I had to draw his attention to it because I realized that in an archdiocesan publication on the back cover, in color, there was an announcement inviting young men who thought they had a vocation to the priesthood to a meeting with Cardinal McCarrick. I immediately phoned Cardinal Whirl, who expressed his surprise to me, telling me that he knew nothing about that announcement and that he would cancel it. If, as he now continues to state, he knew nothing of the abuses committed by McCarrick and the measures taken by Benedict, how can his answer be explained? The Cardinal lies shamelessly." End quote. Now, Cardinal World spokesman 
has confirmed that the Cardinal did in fact cancel that meeting with potential seminarians and McCarrick. Does this undermine his claim that he knew nothing of McCarrick's misdeeds? Robert Royal. Well, yes. I mean, <laughs> just very simply, of course, because everyone knew of the, the seminarians. No one knew of the underage criminal abuse that the Cardinal ev eventually it became right. public through that particular case. But everyone knew. I knew, it, going yeah. back to the 1980s, we, we all heard about this. We heard was, the story. There was just too much of it. It had to be obvious. Mm -hmm. Now, it's very clear that uh, Cardinal Worrell is denying that he received any documentation or information from the Vatican about this. About these sanctions. About these sanctions. Mm -hmm. However, it's, an, it's also clear that he knew why it was that Vigano called him on this and why it was necessary to move McCarrick from the seminary that we, he was in to a parish somewhere so he wouldn't be in contact with seminarians. Yeah. To me, it's just implausible that Cardinal Worrell didn't know. Mm -hmm. And we don't know exactly how these sanctions were imposed. I heard from credible sources for a while that, that McCarrick was ignoring them anyway. Mm -hmm. But the fact that it, it's, it's just beggars belief that Cardinal Worrell didn't know yeah. in the effective sense. Uh, Father Jerry Murray, why would Cardinal Worrell cancel a meeting uh, w uh, with McCarrick if he, it wasn't connected to his history of sexual abuse? Uh, I think Bob is right and absolutely. If Cardinal uh, Worrell gets a phone call from the nuncio saying, why is Cardinal McCarrick meeting with seminarians? And then the Archbishop of Washington says, I will cancel it. Well, why would you cancel it if there's no problem? Mm -hmm. So the same goes for the measure of being removed, uh, moved out of the right. Mater Redemptori Seminary in Washington and going mm -hmm. to live mm -hmm. in a parish in Woodley Park. Right. Uh, that parish, they did extensive renovations to make a room available for him. At St. Uh, Thomas Catholic Parish. Catholic News Agency is reporting that one of the priests, yes, they, and one of the priests there said that uh, they were told that Cardinal Worrell was ordering this. It's inconceivable that a pastor would be receiving uh, a retired cardinal in his rectory without the actual Archbishop of Washington knowing about it. Mm -hmm. But what was the reason? Because, um, I, you know, was Cardinal McCarrick unhappy where he was before? I don't, I don't think so. No. I'm going to guess that this is precisely uh, in support of what Archbishop Vigano said, he was no longer allowed to live in a seminary. Mm -hmm. World's office, by the way, has confirmed that McCarrick was moved out of that seminary in D.C. in 2008 to St. Thomas Parish in D.C., is it conceivable, Robert Royal, that uh, a known sex abuser could relocate to a parish and the archbishop wouldn't know about it? The diocese says McCarrick made his own living arrangements. Well, today, Thursday, at the Catholic thing, a uh, priest, Father Timothy Vavrick, has made a very interesting argument. I was very struck by this when I read it myself. He says, look, it's barely possible that there wasn't official notice given to the world. Very implausible, but it's possible. But if so, in a strange way, this confirms what Vigano has been saying, because if Rome mm -hmm. did not alert the Cardinal Archbishop of Washington, D.C., that his predecessor living within the diocese had committed sexual abuse with, with two seminarians who had received a payout, this, too, points to a problem of, we could call it a cover-up, we could call it uh, incompetence, mm -hmm. but there's something wrong here. Yeah. And, um, by the way, in a statement from the Archdiocese of Washington responding to Archbishop Vigano's testimony, Cardinal Worrell has categorically denied any of the information that uh, he claims was passed on to him about McCarrick. Uh, Archbishop Vigano goes on in this testimony, this 11-page testimony. We won't get into all of it, but I'm trying to give you the highlights. He writes about an audience with Pope Francis in June of 2013, where Vigano says Pope Francis assailed him using a tone of reproach. We have video of that. He says during this encounter that you're watching, the bishops in the United States must not be ideologized. They must be shepherds. Confused and embarrassed by the Pope, Vigano says he asked to meet with the pontiff privately to find out what he meant by those words. Now, the video from the Vatican cuts out abruptly during that encounter, but Vigano writes of a subsequent meeting, he says, I began the conversation asking the Pope what he intended to say to me with the words he had addressed to me when I greeted him the previous Friday. And the Pope, in a very different, friendly, almost affectionate tone, said to me, yes, the bishops in the United States must not be ideologized. They must not be right-wing like the Archbishop of Philadelphia. The Pope did not give me the name of the Archbishop, who would venture few. They must be shepherds, and they must not be left-wing. 
And he added, raising both arms. And when I say left-wing, I mean homosexual. Of course, the logic of the correlation between being left-wing and being homosexual escaped me, Vigano writes, but I added nothing else. Father Jerry, what do you make of uh, this correlation in the Pope's mind between left-wing and homosexual and about this whole encounter? Well, I found it puzzling because um, Archbishop Chaput was one of the most outstanding bishops in the United States, and uh, he was recognized as such when he was moved from Denver to Philadelphia uh, under uh, the previous pope. Um, to say that his defense of Catholic doctrine is ideology, if the pope said that, I'd really like to say to the pope, you know, as, as someone, what do you mean, Holy Father? It, ideologies are human creations. Uh, the doctrine of the faith comes from God. Now, as regards correlation between homosexuality and left wing, I don't know what that means either because, uh, as we've seen among those who have been exposed uh, over time as being involved in a homosexual lifestyle among the clergy, there are people from both right and left, mm -hmm. you know, doctrinal conservatives and then liberal, liberal types. So, I don't know about that. It's, it's a little off-putting, the whole thing. Uh, it's unfortunate uh, that uh, the first time that the nuncio was able to meet the Pope that there was this confrontational tone, which mm. indicates to me that there must have been some hostility uh, that uh, the Pope had, had ga ga garnered when talking to people about the nuncio, mm. and I wouldn't be surprised if McCarrick was one of those who had spoken to the Pope. Mm -hmm. Now, Vigano goes on to write uh, this about what he told the Pope regarding Cardinal McCarrick. I'll give both of you a chance to react to this. He writes, immediately after the Pope asked me in a deceitful way, what is Cardinal McCarrick like? I answered him with complete frankness and, if you want, with great naivete. Holy Father, I don't know if you know Cardinal McCarrick, but if you ask the Congregation for Bishops, there is a dossier this thick about him. He corrupted generations of seminarians and priests, and Pope Benedict ordered him to withdraw to a life of prayer and penance. The Pope did not make the slightest comment about those very grave words of mine and did not show any expression of surprise on his face, as if he had already known the matter for some time, and he immediately changed the subject. But then, what was the Pope's purpose in asking me the question, what is Cardinal McCarrick like? He clearly wanted to find out if I was an ally of McCarrick or not. Now, this is really at the heart of the accusation, Robert Royal, because he claims he informed the Pope about McCarrick's record of sexual abuse that day in 2013. What if this is true? Well, if it's true uh, in the sense that we seem to think that it's true, that he now has a, a known abuser that he doesn't do anything about, mm -hmm. this is very grave indeed. But I would connect these two statements, the one okay. you read earlier and, the, and this second yeah. one. I would say that the Holy Father did not know a lot about the United States. He had never visited here until he came in the papal visit a few years ago. Mm -hmm. He doesn't seem to have advisors who know very much about the United States. In fact, it looks like his advisors who, know, who advise him about the United States are Mara Diaga, who is very anti-American, I would say. Probably McCarrick, probably Spadaro, who also has a, a bizarre view of the United mm. States. So for him to ask about McCarrick, especially since we know that McCarrick did play a role in the election of Pope Francis, it's a very complicated situation. Yeah. Now, um, some people have speculated that because he was seeing McCarrick floating around, if McCarrick wasn't following what Pope Benedict had asked him right. to do, he may have just assumed that this wasn't all that, that important. But mm. the fact that he was trying to, to hone in on this and, you know, who is McCarrick? What is he? Are you a supporter of his? Mm. It kind of, for me, it reflects an interest that he knows that there is something very sensitive there. Mm. Father Jerry, Vigano claims that the Pope restored McCarrick's faculties, overruling Benedict's penalties. Now, that would not be out of keeping with some of the other record. In fact, I just pulled a USA Today story. Pope quietly trims sanctions for sex abusers seeking mercy. This is from February of last year. I'll get into it in a minute. But your thought on that allegation that Pope Francis overruled Benedict's penalties vis-a-vis -vis McCarrick? Well, I think here this is the heart of the matter that only Pope Francis can answer, and that is the question, did Archbishop Vigano tell you in June of 2013 that not only was Cardinal McCarrick an abuser, sexual abuser of seminarians, but that also Pope Benedict had uh, imposed these sanctions, these penalties on him. Once he knew that, 
then all subsequent behavior has to be based on what he thinks he needs to do about it. Mm. And from all appearances, he thinks he doesn't have to do much because uh, Cardinal McCarrick not only continued to defy those sanctions, in this case, uh, he got even more responsibility from Pope Francis. So, yeah, it's, uh, the sanctions question is very important, but I think the most important question here is knowledge, because mm -hmm. now that the Pope, uh, the actual Pope, Pope Francis, knows about it, it's up to him to do what he thinks has to be done. Mm -hmm. And uh, these are other cases where the Pope was lax in dealing with some abusive priests. They may give a key to interpretation. I think the Pope, and only the Pope, can tell us, is Archbishop Vigano telling the truth about informing you or not? And then mm -hmm. everything will flow from that. Robert Royal. Yeah, we look, we don't know exactly what Benedict imposed on the Cardinal. He's, it's been confirmed that, in fact, Benedict did impose sanctions, whether they were followed or not by Cardinal McCarrick. But we don't know ex the exact nature of those things. They were, from all reports, he should stay in Washington, not be traveling around, et cetera. But he continued to do this. Right. Now, we do, the, the hard facts that we know after 2013 are these, that somehow McCarrick began to play a role in this papacy. It's, it seems very clear that he played a role in getting uh, our, our Archbishop and then Cardinal Supich appointed in Chicago and Cardinal Tobin appointed in Newark mm -hmm. um, because of some influence somewhere. I mean, it, it just seems that the Holy Father didn't know America very well and took the, the mm -hmm. recommendations of these people. Well, the guy's and, a huge fundraiser. Right. He's raised tens of millions of but dollars and, and was a fixture in Rome. For me, the, the absolute point, whether he lifted them, this is, I don't know what Vigano would mean by he lifted uh -huh. them, but we do know that he began to play a bigger role again in the Vatican. Mm -hmm. And in 2016, which is to say three years after Vigano says he told, he told the Holy Father about McCarrick, mm -hmm. McCarrick was sent as an envoy to negotiate with China. That's right. So three years later, mm -hmm. he must have known a, a lot more by then. He must have heard about the controversies, and yet somehow this influence by McCarrick And was, he was instrumental was in the election, which by his own, you, there's video of him online right. talking at the Villa Stritch, uh, saying, hey, I was, a, an Italian gentleman approached me and I, I started whipping votes for him and encouraging people to vote for this guy. He was a friend of mine. So clearly he had a hand in the election of Francis, maybe with his eye on, I can slip these sanctions off if I get a different pope elected. Vigano accuses many prelates in this testimony of complicity in covering up immoral behavior. And has this to say about networks present in the church. We'll put it up on the screen. Corruption in the misuse of the church's resources and of the offerings of the faithful must be fought against. The seriousness of homosexual behavior must be denounced. The homosexual network present in the church must be eradicated. These homosexual networks, which are now widespread in many dioceses, seminaries, religious orders, etc., act under the concealment of secrecy and lies with the power of octopus tentacles and strangle innocent victims and priestly vocations and are strangling the entire church, Vigano writes. How widespread is this problem? And uh, this is being used, Father Jerry, to discredit Vigano. They say he's uh, an anti-gay crusader and he's somebody who, you know, has an ax to grind. Well, let's go back to the record. Um, Rembert Weakland was the Archbishop of Milwaukee. He had a homosexual lover who was uh, someone who turned against Weakland. Weakland took $500,000 of the money of the Archdiocese of uh, Milwaukee, mm -hmm. paid it to this guy to shut him up. And then when it was uh, revealed that he had done this, uh, because the Finance Council of the Diocese knew nothing about it, he right. then claimed, well, that was all the earnings I got from my speeches, which, by the way, didn't amount to 500000 and it's immaterial because that money was misused. He was not indicted on embezzlement charges, mm -hmm. but I have a feeling if the, the owner you know, of a local business had done the similar things and his business partners found out that he would have been indicted. Mm -hmm. Let's go to the Newark and Metuchen payoffs. Those are actual use of money, as far as we can tell, of those dioceses to keep quiet two adult victims of Cardinal McCarrick. There has to be more cases, and that's why people want investigation to be carried out. Mm -hmm. I'm absolutely in favor of that because, let, and let's be blunt here, Raymond, people go to church, put money in the basket, or go to Catholic charity fundraisers, give money to the Catholic Church, mm -hmm. not so that immoral men can protect their reputations by paying off the people that they, you know, sexually abuse. Yeah. And if we can't assure the faithful that, you know, we're not going to t tolerate this kind of payoff system anymore, mm -hmm. 
part of that has to be we're going to account for all the payoffs we've made in the past. Right. Because it's not enough to say, well, going forward, everything's fine. No, no. Let's have accounting because we don't know who made what payoffs to whom. Mm -hmm. Very, very serious matter here. This cannot be ignored. Finances are one of the keys to on getting rid of corruption, and that really has to be part of this investigation. Robert Royal, I want you to react to this. I, I alluded to this moments ago, this USA Today piece. Uh, this is Nicole Winfield uh, at the Associated Press. And in February of 2017, she writes about Pope Francis having mercy, he, and he was trying to be merciful, I think, to these sex abusers, affirmed sex abusers. An Italian priest who received the Pope's clemency was later convicted by an Italian criminal court for his sex crimes against children as young as 12. Father Mauro Inzoli, I remember we reported on this case, yeah, the Inzoli case is one of several in which Francis overruled the advice of the Vatican's Congregation for the Doctrine of Faith and reduced the sentence uh, that called for the priest to be defrocked. Instead, he was sentenced to a lifetime of prayer and penance, which is what was the sanction imposed on McCarrick. And they go on here, and I'll just read this and I want your reaction. Uh, she writes, with all this emphasis on mercy, this is a Vatican official, he is creating the environment for such initiatives, adding that clemency petitions were rarely granted under Pope Benedict, who launched a tough crackdown between 2005 and 2013 and defrocked some 800 priests who raped and molested children. Yeah, what's left out in that way of, con of conceptualizing mercy are the victims. I mean, obviously, all people deserve to um, receive God's grace and God's forgiveness if they confess and repent. But we've got a network of victims. I mean, that earlier passage that you read, I, I see that as the heart of Vigano. Vigano mm. is a man who I think has been personally moved to step out in this bold way because he's just seen too much. And I don't think that that octopus that he's talking about is solely here in the United States. Mm -hmm. I mean, we've seen this already in Chile. We've seen it in Honduras. We saw it in Rome, Australia, in orgies in, in, in that yeah, apartment. I mean, these, these are not particularly North American problems. They're right. problems that exist everywhere where abuses happen. The, the Dutch case with Dan Eels, right. uh, who has been a close associate of the Holy Fathers, who he's even invited to the synods in, in Rome, in a, in a way that's just mystifying for those of us who th think that we need to take these things seriously. So, yeah, mercy is fine, but a mercy that keeps a guy in, in some restricted area doing prayer and penance, that's fine, as long as he's not put back into a, a rectory somewhere or in a school or wherever mm -hmm. it might be. But we must never forget that there are victims here who also, and potential future victims, right. about whom... We must be just so that the mercy does not lead to further abuse. Yeah, no, it's not worth, I'm sorry, that mercy, it's not worth one more victim. And, and, and the, the, the carnage left behind, I mean, you and I have spoken to these victims. You see the hurt, the wounds that do not heal. These are old men who break down in tears and shiver in front of you retelling these stories. That, that you know, I, I realize there's an emotional part of it, and you have to acknowledge that pain, but there is justice due here. And you can't just let these people go on because they're wearing red or magenta. Uh, Pope Francis did react with a non-answer of sorts to this Vigano testimony. Here's what he said on the papal plane on Sunday. I will translate. He says here, I read that statement this morning. I read it, and I will say sincerely that I must say this to you and all of you who are interested. Read the document carefully and judge it for yourselves. I will not say one word on this. I think the statement speaks for itself, and you have sufficient journalistic capacity to reach your own conclusions. It is an act of trust. When time will pass and you'll draw the conclusions, maybe I will speak, but I'd like that you do this job in a professional way. What do you make of that and the Pope's reaction, Father Jerry Murray? Well, I think it's unsatisfactory uh, precisely because the Pope has said in talking about bishops in Chile and in Ireland and other places that the culture of cover-up has to end. And part of the culture of cover-up is this silence that when a uh, very uh, charges are brought up, very serious matters are brought to the attention of people, then people suddenly don't want to talk about it. Now, the Pope does say, maybe I'll talk about it later after yeah. the journalists do their job. But in my, in my opinion, the journalists are doing their job by asking Pope about it. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I wrote an article on First Things website in which I said, is it likely that a man who's innocent uh, of serious charges would say nothing? 
Now, it's possible because he may want to marshal his thoughts and come later, but I wish the, if that was the case, the Pope should have told us that, right. uh, that he is, in fact, going to respond thoroughly. But, um, you know, look, if, if let's say a bishop were accused of doing the similar thing, that he had an auxiliary bishop who was abusive, and yet he didn't let anybody know, he paid money, he kept it quiet, and then uh, when the bishop, when the Pope found out about it, and the bishop went before the Pope, and the Pope said, did you do this? And the bishop said, I won't say a word about it. Mm. That would never happen. The Pope yeah. would say, you don't say a word about it, you're out. Yeah. Now, we have to hold everybody in the church to the same standard because justice is not about persons. Justice is about God's judgment. Mm -hmm. And we're all under it, whether we're the Pope or, or an altar mm. boy or, you know, or a, the latest uh, thing in, in the church. We can't say because the Pope said he's not going to talk about it, we have to keep silent. I don't believe that. Yeah. Uh, Robert Royal, uh, many Catholics were so heartbroken, really, by this answer because I think they were looking for clarity from the Pope. And he's promised zero tolerance in Ireland. He said, we will be fully accountable. We will demand justice. This can't happen again. And then this answer comes. And give me your take on this. It seems to my eye what he did, wittingly or unwittingly, is unleash the media hordes on Vigano, saying, you go look at him. Look into his backyard. And now what I see on social media, in, in public events, Catholic are upon Catholic, bishop are opposed to bishop. It's created this acrimony and craziness that we might have been able to put a little cool balm on and bring the temperature down. Your reaction? Yeah, in addition to being a non-answer answer, it's a very strange, I mean, we've had a lot of strange remarks that the Holy Father makes on planes when he's coming back from places. We've covered them in, you yes. know, in previous shows in previous years. I actually listened to this very carefully several times in Italian, and mm -hmm. I, I must say, I don't understand it. Right after he says what you, you, you read, he yeah. says to the journalist, it will do you good to pursue this. It's a very strange statement just in, in terms of the way he kind of formulates it. And I, it's clear to me he's fumbling in, in some important way. Mm -hmm. However, if journalists begin to look at this carefully, that's all to the good. Mm -hmm. Now, it isn't only, by the way, people who are nervous or, or have had problems with Francis that uh, want to see this looked into. America Magazine, which is the Jesuit magazine in the United States of America, has said that the Pope must lead on this matter, that he, mm -hmm. he cannot be passive. He cannot just allow others to do the, this investigation. The church mm -hmm. itself, and it can only come from the Holy Father, the church itself must show that it is willing to look at the specifics. You can talk about the octopus and networks and whatnot, mm -hmm. and eventually we will get to that, but yeah. we must begin with who did what. And when. You know, 96% of the priests in the United States did not abuse during those 70 years that the John Jay study examined. Only 4% did. And the 96% are in your parish every Sunday now apologizing and yeah. having to come up with reasons why this yeah. shouldn't be disturbing to, to, to Catholics. We must know specifically who did what, and we need, yeah. we probably need the secular media to look into this too because it's a very big job to, to look globally yeah. about where, where things are gonna be. But ultimately, yeah. the church itself the, the tribunals that exist apparently are not sufficient. Yeah. We need to devote more manpower and more resources, more money, yeah. to making sure that this is rooted. We're going to get to that solution at the end of the show. In his testimony, and Father Jerry, I want you to react to this. In his testimony, Archbishop Vigano calls for the Pope to resign in a kind of explosive conclusion. He says, Pope Francis has repeatedly asked for total transparency in the church and for bishops and the faithful to act with paresia. He must honestly state that when he first learned about the crimes committed by McCarrick, who abused his authority with seminarians and priests, in any case, the Pope learned about it from me on June 23, 2013, and continued to cover for him. In this extremely dramatic moment for the Universal Church, he must acknowledge his mistakes, and in keeping with the principle, proclaimed principle of zero tolerance, Pope Francis must be the first to set a good example for cardinals and bishops who covered up McCarrick's abuses and resign along with all of them. Father Jerry, your reaction, is it appropriate for anyone, including a bishop, to call for the Pope to resign? Well, this is a serious question that can only lead to a, a, a generalized reflection. Uh, what I mean is this. If the Pope 
uh, is held to the same standard that every other bishop is held to, then if it's true that he enabled an abusive cardinal to continue to publicly be acclaimed, to be considered a man of importance, to be under no restrictions, to have no history of abuse, uh, then he has to look in, in the mirror in the morning and say, am I the person who should continue to hold the pontificate? Because if a bishop under me had done all those things, I would remove him. This is what he has said. He removed Bishop Barros in Chile as the Bishop of Azorno once he was convinced that Barros had covered up for Caradima, this evil priest yeah. who was abusing uh, young boys at his parish. Now, if, he's, if Barros' cover-up deserves a, a removal from the uh, office of bishop, the pope is the only one who can remove himself. Now, mm -hmm. the pope has to answer the question that we've been posing all night. Did you know about McCarrick? When did you know it? What did mm -hmm. you know? And what did you think was the right thing to do about it? Mm -hmm. uh, so, I'll say this. I respect what the uh, Archbishop Vigano uh, memo says, uh, and pending further investigation, uh, I think it'll be clear what the uh, the Pope's actions were, and then we can determine what is the appropriate uh, measure to uh, bring justice to that situation. Mm. Robert Royal, uh, Pope Francis did impose sanctions on McCarrick once it became clear by the Cardinal of New York and media reports that there was credible evidence of a sexual abuse of a minor. Uh, does that in any way exonerate him here? I don't know. I, I think Father Jerry put this in, in very good terms. I mean, we want to be cautious about what charges we make and what we think people ought to do. Right. If it is true that he lifted sanctions knowing what he knew, I, I, I think that it's a clear-cut case at that point. He's put himself in a very difficult situation. If instead it is an error that, as he did, as he made in Chile, in Chile he said, look, I was part of the problem, and, you know, he confesses this, asks to, to be... Mm -hmm. uh, forgiven and okay we move on he apologized about this but this is a very very serious question because we've got a person who clearly has been influencing this papacy and inf influence influencing the church in the United States and elsewhere so um, I'm glad in a way that Vigano raised this question is it true that even the Pope of Rome mm -hmm. must be accountable to the same kinds of things that everyone else is accountable to but we'll have to have further information before we can decide about that. And then ultimately it's going to be up to Fr Francis to decide what is the good yeah. for the church. Yeah, I, I, I have to tell you, um, and you all may disagree and I'll let you hear just very briefly. I, I'm a little squeamish about the idea of a pope resigning again. I, I, I worry about people suggesting that he should resign. You know, canon law, Father Jerry, there is no mechanism to remove the pope. He would have to do this of his own authority. No one can do it for him, right? Yeah, the, the Pope is not subject to removal by any of uh, the cardinals or the bishops. No, the Pope, he enjoys that office until death or resignation. Uh, but he can make a resignation and he can mm -hmm. do so freely, even if it's under pressure in the sense that he uh, is hearing from the public that because he protected an abusive cardinal that he should, he should no longer continue. He can make a free decision. But um, mm -hmm. it's a very dramatic thing, naturally, and we don't like to see it. But on the other hand, the, the moral outrage that comes from finding out that a cardinal who previously had been punished by one pope is now favored by the next, the question is, well, why was he punished? And now we know, right. because he abused seminarians. And then secondly, why is he favored now? Yeah. That's a question that needs to be answered. We, we now he's no longer favored because of the, what Bob mentioned. Mm. We need to get some answers here. And um, I want to get into some of the criticism of Archbishop Vigano, which also demands scrutiny. Several cardinals and bishops have come out criticizing Vigano's testimony, specifically those named in it, attempting to discredit him. Cardinal Blaise Supich of Chicago had this to say of Vigano's testimony in an interview in Chicago Watch. The Pope has a bigger agenda. He's got to get on with other things, of uh, talking about the environment and uh, protecting uh, migrants and carrying on the work of the church. We're not going to go down a rabbit hole on this. Rabbit hole? Well, I, I have to tell you, this took my breath away, that victims abused young men and boys in seminaries, corruption on multi-levels in the clergy, their enablers, that's a rabbit hole? That's a rabbit hole we need to close up, would seem to me. 
Look, why does the church exist? The church exists to support us in this life, to live a good Christian life, and ultimately to get us to heaven. Whether the church has a strong voice about environmentalism or refugees or whatever else, these are important issues. They're, the, the church ought to be perhaps involved in speaking about those. But that's not the primary function of the church. Yeah. And when you have people within the church itself abusing their, their authority and their positions that may lead to the damage of souls forever, yeah. I, I don't see how you can call this a rabbit hole. Yeah. It, may, it may look like a small matter to s someone, but that's a very strange point of view. Yeah, no, that's bizarre. I told a reporter the other day, Father Jerry, um, when they were coming, you know, saying, well, Vigano did this, and what about this from Vigano? And I said, wait a minute, wait a minute. When uh, Ashley Judd and um, Asia Argento raised questions about Harvey Weinstein, we didn't attack the whistleblowers. You look at the allegations, you verify that, then you look into the background of the, of the whistleblower. But here it's like it's inverse. They're looking to kind of do them in. Um, there was also this line. I want you to react to it, Father. Quite frankly, they also don't like him because he's a Latino. Father Jerry. Um, that's from the uh, world of who knows where. I mean, no one has said anything against the Pope's racial background. Number one, he is an Italian Argentinian. He's not Spanish, you know, of mm -hmm. descent. Uh, and he is, uh, he has, no one has attacked him because he's from a Latin American country. I, I, for me, that's, you know, that's what we call misdirection. You're trying mm -hmm. to distract from something by raising yeah. a, you know, a serious charge. That's not, that's ridiculous. Mm -hmm. I want to quickly get to these uh, other charges against Archbishop Vigano. Andrea Tornielli, uh, who writes at La Stampa and others, they're suggesting that if Vigano is correct and sanctions had been imposed on McCarrick before 2011, why did he continue to show up, Vigano, at galas around the world, at times with McCarrick? In February of 2013, here is McCarrick meeting with Pope Benedict on EWTN's airwaves. Then in 2012, in Manhattan, Archbishop Vigano himself salutes McCarrick. Listen. Distinguished guest, bishop, here present, first of all, His Eminence Cardinal Theodore McCarrick. His ambassador from quite a, a certain time as a priest, as a bishop, as a bishop and cardinal, and very much love from us all. Does this undermine Vigano's argument? If he knew of this, if he's so outraged by it, why is he introducing McCarrick at these events? Well, it's troubling, and I, I think if one, or, if one of us did that, it would be yeah. even more troubling. But a man who's in a diplomatic position and mm -hmm. you know, is going through certain processes that the church, you know, these mm -hmm. formalities that the church provides at different times, he's in a, a slightly different situation. Plus, a diplomat has to tell his bosses what the problem is. A, uh, you know, a U.S. Um, ambassador in some foreign country that knows about a problem doesn't automatically deal with it himself. He, he, he reports back to the State Department and to the White House, and his, it's his superiors that have to do something about it. Yes, there are these inconsistencies. There are these yeah. gaps. There are these problems. But I'm with uh, Father Murray that uh, even if these exist, what is more important is not is the truth teller or the, is the messenger imperfect. Of course he is. Mm -hmm. Whistleblowers always have you know, multiple motives. Sure. And, and they're involved in very different things. Mm -hmm. But the things that he points to as problematic, those have to be looked at in and of themselves, irrespective of the, the uh, messenger. Father Jerry, what about uh, McCarrick globetrotting after these sanctions had been imposed by McCarrick? Now, we should remind everybody, McCarrick was known to kind of flout authority. Remember, I think it was 2005, Pope then uh, Archbishop or Cardinal Ratzinger had written a letter to the bishops of the United the States, 2004 wrote a, a letter to the bishops about denying communion to pro-choice politicians. He gave that and entrusted it to Cardinal McCarrick to bring to the other bishops. McCarrick pocketed the letter, and it wasn't until later it was leaked through Rome. What, what was the content of the letter? So he's kind of been running outside the lines for a while. No, uh, Cardinal McCarrick's whole life has been lived recklessly. Well, let's just face it. Uh, he was, or, when ordained a priest, uh, then uh, the first Charlie baptized, he uh, then later committed sexual abuse against that boy. Mm. He, he abused a seminarian at St. Patrick's Cathedral in the sacristy. Uh, he lied to the American bishops about the letter from Cardinal Ratzinger. Uh, he said the exact opposite of what the letter said, and then Rome leaked it. 
Yeah. Somebody leaked it and it got to the press. And in fact, it was then an acknowledged by the Holy See to be an accurate letter. Mm. Um, you know, I think it would be good. Archbishop Vigano has been uh, correcting the record. He corrected the record about uh, his dealings with Archbishop Ninstead and mm -hmm. the investigation there. It would be good for him to address this question of why he appeared in public with McCarrick. I think it's what mm -hmm. Bob is saying I, I uh, tend that to he wanted to be right. polite and maintain, you know. Mm -hmm. The sanctions were private for a reason. Benedict did not want uh, to have this thing become known publicly, so naturally you wouldn't scold the man in public for being out there. Mm -hmm. Who knows what he told him in private. In any event, as the main point here is not what did Vigano uh, do when McCarrick flouted his uh, restrictions. The real question is why did McCarrick have those restrictions and who knew about them mm -hmm. and why were those restrictions then lifted? Yeah, well, uh, and, and uh, frankly, if I could talk just uh, honestly here, Benedict was probably too merciful with McCarrick. He should have publicly stripped him of the office because he, he had been abusing seminarians, which, you know, n while maybe not as detrimental as, as abusing a child, tell the victim that. It hurts just as bad or worse. Um, there's been a groundswell of Episcopal no. support for Vigano's testimony. Uh, Bishop Olmsted of Phoenix, Strickland of Tyler, Morlino of Madison, the bishops of Sacramento, Honolulu, Oklahoma, Paprocki in, in Springfield, Cordelione uh, of San Francisco, I'll read this. He says to deny them, the accusations, would continue a culture of denial and obfuscation. Um, I'll read you a few more. Strickland, th they are still allegations, but as your shepherd, I find them credible. The response must be a full investigation. Um, perhaps most importantly, the bishop's conference and the president of that conference, Cardinal DiNardo, issued this statement. The recent letter of Archbishop Carlo Maria Vigano brings particular focus and urgency to this examination. The questions raised deserve answers that are conclusive and based on evidence, without those answers, innocent men may be tainted by false accusation and the guilty may be left to repeat sins of the past. I am eager for an audience with the Holy Father to earn his support for our plan of action. So far, the Vatican has been very quiet on this. Robert Royal and then Father Jerry, what should be going on now? Well, you know, I just came back from Ireland. I was over speaking at a conference in Ireland and then uh, covered some of the world meeting of families there. And I think that this, you see this everywhere. You see it in Italy. You see it in Chile. You see it in the United States. People are happy that the Holy Father comes and apologizes and says there have been great failures. But he also said, they, they also say, that's fine, but now we need to see action, see actual heads roll. And this is why I keep going back to that we can... We can debate all we want whether Vigano is this or he's that or it, it, what his motives are. We know that there have been names and places and documents and dates provided with us. You simply cannot walk away from that at this point. Yeah. And the only way that the church is going to regain the trust of people is not by talking about care for, for victims. That's going to take place with parish priests and religious mm -hmm. and, and lay people. It's got to be the leadership itself is going to take action. And I'm rather proud of the bishops in the United States. We're not where we need to be yet, but they're at least getting to the point where they're going to try to set up the kinds of mechanisms that are going to hold people accountable. Father Jerry, one minute. What do you think should be happening now? What kind of investigative organization is needed to plumb the depths of this and see what we're dealing with? Well, we need honesty, openness, and we also need uh, the people involved to be answering questions so that we can get the answers. What we do not need is a private behind-the-scenes investigation carried on without anything being known. Now, the mechanisms here are interesting because the Pope is the one who supervises the universal bit church and therefore all the bishops. So, as I've said on your show before, I think there should be a tribunal established mm -hmm. specifically for the United States to examine all the arch archives in the very diocese and take testimony about mm. this problem of sexual abuse and financial regularity. Yeah. As regards the Roman problem, I know I'm a priest, parish priest in New York. Uh, the Pope can uh, listen to me or not, but I would say from my position, my parishioners, the people I know, they'll only be reassured when the Holy Father addresses the specific charges that uh, Archbishop Vigano made, mm. answers whether they're true or false, and then honestly submits himself to the same kind of provisions that he would if any bishop with a similar accusation uh, came clean in front of him. Mm. Uh, the, peop the American people, the people of the Catholic Church throughout the world, we deserve honesty, holiness, and doctrinal fidelity. 
No. We do not deserve what Archbishop Vigano says is happening, which is a culture of secrecy and, and quite frankly, immoral behavior being protected. We yeah. don't need that. No, the church's moral authority is on the line here. And uh, I, I personally think, I've said it before, we need an independent lay audit, financial audit first. That should be coupled with a uh, curial audit that with investigators, with, with true, clear eyes who will come in and call out those who need to be called out. Uh, you can keep up with all of Robert Royal and Father Jerry Murray's insightful commentary at thecatholicthing.org. Before I let you all go, I have to put this up on the screen. One of our mischievous viewers came up with this. Look, we're the Ghostbusters. <laughs> the posse is now little Ghostbusters. Well, we left our proton packs at home, but maybe next time. Thank you for both for being here.